Hello, everybody. I hope you're having a good week. I uh, hope you're excited to dig into Scripture. I certainly am. And um, we're going to be looking at the second chapter of Second Timothy, which has some really cool stuff in it. As usual, I'm just going to pull out and talk about some things that interest me, some things that I think are worth talking about, some observations, kind of in a selfish way, but I hope that they're useful to you also, and I hope that they help you um, focus in and kind of study this passage of scripture uh, in a better way uh, than you would be able to do by yourself, right? Uh, this passage has several kind of famous parts or famous features. Uh, some of you might recall or, or, or be aware of some uh, Christian organizations that even uh, draw their name from this idea of approved workmen not being ashamed. That's here in our passage today, verse 15 of chapter 2. Um, but also has some things that are really uncomfortable, and I think things that cause a lot of uh, maybe uh, casual Christians, if that's even possible, to maybe get a bit uncomfortable or concerned. Um, so the first thing I really want to point out is actually this idea of suffering. We've talked about this before, um, and actually Paul used the word suffering explicitly twice in chapter 1 of First Timothy. Those were in verses um, 8 and 12 of chapter 1, and he uses that word again twice in chapter 2. And that's just the word suffering not talking about or not including when he talks about his chain or, or these other kind of ways of being limited or or um, constrained for the gospel and i think it's really important to remember as christians we cannot get away from this central element of suffering and it's it's not something we should be desiring to get away from jesus suffered very clearly very um outwardly with a, with a very clear purpose. Um, Paul um, also suffered uh, in a very in very extreme ways and and he's telling Timothy in a very personal heartfelt letter that he needs to share in the suffering as well, being a good soldier. So he uses these analogies, right? Soldiers don't join the army because they think it's going to be, you know, like picking flowers and just skipping around all day. It's it's it requires dedication. It requires um, sacrifice, and it requires some tough stuff. The same thing with athletes, right? There's these there's these images that go in and help. And if any of you have played sports, or maybe know people who have been really really into sports at a high level, you know the types of sacrifices they have to make about their sleep and their nutrition and their workout routines and all kinds of stuff. It requires sacrifice and Christianity is is no different. If you want to be a, a good Christian soldier, right, as Paul says, you have to be sacrificing things. You have to be um, giving certain things up. You have to be holding yourself to a different standard, really. So I really think we need to lean into that um, idea, the importance of suffering, because it is a very un-American uh, concept. It's very unattractive to a lot of the um, ways that people in our world today want to live. Um, the other thing I want to point out is uh, in verses 11 through 13, we have this really cool hymn. And we know once again that this is a hymn because um, the words are very clearly kind of rhyming and in a meter. And um, these are some of the earliest affirmations that Christians made, that Christians um, reminded um, themselves and each other about what it meant to be a Christian, what it meant to follow God, who God was. And I love this idea. If we deny him, he will deny us, but that doesn't mean he is faithless, because if we are faithless, he remains faithful. So God is who he is, but if, if we choose to reject him, he will honor that decision, and he will essentially let us uh, reject him. That's really important. Um, next, there's this idea of wrangling over words, as it says in my translation right now, the NRSV. I, I love that idea of wrangling, and there's so much that happens almost every day, probably, for me. I see 
um, well, mainly on the internet, uh, but in I here and other places too, Christians arguing over particular words and and they sometimes lose sight of the bigger things and it's just very interesting to me to think that these problems have been existing within the church for a very long time and we need to remember um, so Paul uh, expands that idea by saying um, warn uh, warn these people that they are to avoid wrangling over words which does no good but only ruins those who are listening um, I think there's a lot of that right now. A lot of people get ruined over listening to um, arguments and debates on uh, social media or, or in the political kind of public square realm. I don't need to give examples of that. Uh, the next thing I want to pull out is in verse 18 of chapter 2. Uh, it, it talks, this is kind of a unique insight because Paul puts a finger on, he identifies some of the specific teachings of the false teachers, um, Hymenius and Philetus. He says they have swerved from the truth by claiming that the resurrection has already taken place. Now, this is not the resurrection of Christ they're talking about. This is the general resurrection. I think one of the reasons this might be kind of weird for us or that it might not land for, for many Christians is because we don't think as much about the resurrection that is to come as early Christians did. I might have mentioned this before, so forgive me, but if you ever have the opportunity to go to Rome, you definitely need to check out some of the catacombs that are on the outskirts of the city where they buried, um, Christians buried dead Christians, and they worshiped there right among them because to them, their hope in the resurrection was so strong that it was something they thought about all the time. In fact, most cathedrals in Europe that you go to will have some type of um, crypt or um, place where dead people are are buried either under the church um, within the kind of main portion of the church or outside the church in cemeteries and the reason for this is because Christians were looking forward to the resurrection with such zeal with such um, anticipation that it was something they they thought about and they were reminded of every day these dead brothers and sisters are going to rise again and we are going to um, spend eternity together with them um, we don't place a high enough priority on the resurrection um, if you ask me and I'm speaking for Christians today especially in America um, one of the reasons I could say a lot more about that one of the reasons I think is because our lives for many of us are very good and why would we need to wait for something else that's really good if we're pretty comfortable right now? A lot of the early Christians, as you may know, um, their lives were tough. They were persecuted. Um, they were mistreated. They were misunderstood. They were excluded from uh, participation in various things and parts of society. Some of them were even fed to the lions and um, murdered and put to death. And so if that's your context, if that's your situation, resurrection um, becomes much more important. And it has always been a central part of the Christian hope. So these guys, these false teachers are saying it already happened. Um, <clears throat> some, some scholars think they might be talking about a spiritual resurrection. So it's like in your heart you've been resurrected. Um, but it's very important for Christians. I don't want to beat a dead horse, but Christians have always believed not in a spiritual resurrection, but in a bodily resurrection. We will all die. We will be raised again bodily. There will be the judgment, and we will um, either go to be with God or go to be separated from God for the rest of eternity. Last small thing I want to pull out of here. Verses 20 and 21 have this really interesting kind of image of utensils in a household. And Paul says some of them are made out of gold and silver, other th of them are made out of wood and clay. Some for special use, some for ordinary. That's how my Bible translates it. The, the actual words here are honorable uses and dishonorable uses. Um, now, there's a few, there's a, there's a surprising amount of uh, uh, opinions about what Paul's talking about here. This may be another instance, like Peter says about Paul. Some of the things Paul says are kind of hard to understand. 
when I was looking earlier today about what the church fathers say, it's almost an even split as far as I can tell. Some fathers think that this is talking about the, the, the house is referring to the world at large. Some of them are thinking about the church. Um, I'm going to return to that in just a second. I like to think when I was doing this, I was thinking about my favorite tools and how how good it is to know that I have a reliable hammer that feels good in my hands, that always um, is is true, and I can always depend on it when I need to turn to it. And I think that that is something going on here where we are, if we are equipped, if we set ourselves apart for God to use us in a specific task, I think it gives God great pleasure to be able to turn and, and use us as his reliable and honorable special utensils for special tasks. Um, now regarding whether the house is the world of the church, this is a very interesting concept and I'm going to do my best to try to give you my perspective on this. I think that the church sometimes we use it in an interesting way because the capital C church is made up of people who belong to God. But churches, lowercase c, um, have all kinds of disruptions and problems and, and brokenness within them. And um, I think that most people would be able to recognize that maybe not everybody who has ever stepped foot in a church is a building is part of the capital C church or maybe not everybody who hangs out with church people or who goes to the potlucks or the barbecues is part of the capital C church so in a way the church is this kind of meeting point between the world and God's people right the bride of Christ we know the church is is um, going to be presented to God without blemish because because Christ laid down his life for the bride of the church but churches are places where there's lots of um, different stuff going on lots of kind of strife and disagreement and discord sometimes so this idea of special utensils and then ordinary utensils wood and clay that are used for dishonorable uses I think is a good picture about um, uh, a lot of churches because we always see a mix and um, it's it's a reminder that our hope is not set on the institution of the church. Um, churches are, are made up of people. It's set on being God's chosen people and being part of this capital C church, or um, they're not exactly synonymous, but part of the kingdom of God, right? And if we, if our citizenship is in heaven, to use other words from Paul, then I think that we can fairly understand ourselves as special utensils, and we need to focus on um, being ready to be used when God wants to use us. Um, regarding the wood and the clay, I personally think that Paul has in mind here probably most immediately false teachers because that's what he's been talking about throughout these letters, right? And this is an interesting example. Again, these false teachers, it seems like they used to be associated with the church or with churches. They were doing some stuff, but in Paul's mind, they're cut off now because they have abandoned the truth or they have um, their consciences have been seared with a hot iron. So hopefully that gives you some stuff to think about. Um, this is a dense passage and I don't want to pretend it's easy. Um, so sorry if it makes you have to think a little bit, but I think that's really healthy. In fact, this is a perfect way to, I wasn't planning this, perfect way to wrap it up. Paul says in verse 7 of chapter 2 to Timothy, Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in all these things. He doesn't say exactly, this is exactly what it means to understand me. He says, think over what I say, and God's going to help you. So I hope you can think over what I say, and I hope that God helps you um, come to an understanding um, that is useful and constructive for your life. Bye for now.